In this video, I'm going to talk about how to linearize a graph. I'm going to talk about the skill of linearization in physics. And to probe uh, the importance of this idea, this skill in physics, I want to start with an example. The example I want to start with is going to uh, be talking about an object that is traveling with a constant acceleration. So some object that has a constant acceleration. And the first thing I'd like to do is to consider a graph of this object's velocity as a function of time. And so for a moment, let's assume that the object starts off with zero velocity, so it's right here at the origin. And let's assume also that the acceleration that this object has is positive. So, you know, this object that initially starts off with zero velocity, as a result of this positive constant acceleration, would speed up, would have its velocity increase. And those of you who have studied kinematics know that the slope of a velocity versus time graph represents the acceleration of the object. So what we should see is that this graph here should have a positive constant slope because the acceleration is positive and constant. And so in this particular graph, the acceleration is represented by the slope of that object. When you're in a math class and you're studying straight lines or graphs uh, of things that have constant slope, there's an equation that you use to describe those kinds of graphs. y equals mx plus b. But in physics, we use different symbols, and the quantities have a little bit more meaning. So today, I'm going to replace y, what is being plotted on the vertical axis, with v, the velocity of the object. And I'm going to replace m, which represents the slope of our graph, with a, the acceleration. x represents what we plot on the horizontal axis, which is t. And then lastly, plus b represents the, the y-intercept. So in our case, uh, the object started off with an initial velocity of 0. And so we don't have anything there. Plus 0 is what our equation should say. Uh, if I instead was talking about an object that had some sort of an initial velocity, like let's say it started here and had a constant acceleration, then uh, instead of starting off at 0, maybe it starts off with some initial velocity v0. In the event that that was happening, uh, then my equation on the right-hand side would have a plus v0 instead of a plus 0. And those of you who have studied kinematics know that if I rearrange this equation, v equals v0 plus at, that is one of our kinematic equations that we often use to solve problems in physics. So there is some there are ways to relate what I'm seeing in the graph to the equation of a line, and that can be useful because uh, not only does it lead to this equation, but it also allows us to understand things like, okay, this is what the slope represents, this is what the y-intercept represents. And so in a more difficult case where I didn't know what equation represented the object's motion or the, you know, whatever physical situation I was looking at, I might be able to create an equation that would describe what the object was doing or the physical situation. Let's take this one step further. Instead, I want to look at a graph of the object's position as a function of time. If I graph the object's position as a function of time, let's again say now that the object is starting with zero this time for the position. If something has a constant acceleration, you should know what we end up with for the position versus time graph is a curved line, something like this. And so what can we do with this? Well, we can study all sorts of things and learn that the slope of this graph represents the object's velocity, and since the object's velocity is increasing, we're seeing the slope increasing, and there's all sorts of wonderful things that we can study. Students in math classes also learn that there are equations that, that, that describe this, you know, parabolic shape of this graph that I'm looking at. But just for a moment, let's say that our object is starting off with an, an initial position of zero and an initial velocity of zero. So the same sort of situation that I started with up above, but the acceleration, right, 
is you know some value some something that is not zero if that were the case the kinematic equation I might apply to try and better understand what's going on is this one here the new position of the object is equal to the the object's initial position plus the distance it travels as a result of its initial velocity plus the distance it travels as a result of its acceleration and in my particular case the initial position of the object and the initial velocity of the object were both zero so those first two terms would be zero and my equation reduces down to one half a t squared so now let's take this equation and do the same thing that we did up above. Let's compare it to the equation of a line. The difference between what we did up above and what we're doing now is we know that the equation that describes what I'm seeing in the graph isn't linear. The equation that's up above is showing you that the velocity and time have a linear relationship so what I see in the graph is linear. But down below, apparently the relationship between position and time for an object that is accelerating is not linear. And the way that I know that is because when I look at the equation, I see x equals t squared. And that reminds me of a sort of parabolic kind of graph, and that's what we see. So here's how we could analyze this. If I look at my equation and I say, let's go ahead and plot as I already am on the vertical axis let's plot the X position of this object and then on the horizontal axis instead of plotting T I'm going to plot T squared the reason why I'm choosing to do that is because when I look at my equation outside of everything that is circled in yellow which are the variables the things that change over time the stuff that's left over, which I'm circling in green, is constant. At the beginning, my declaration was that the acceleration is constant, and one-half is just a constant as well. So one-half times a constant acceleration is a constant. And so based on matching up the variables in this way, I know that if I make a graph of, instead of position versus time, if I make a graph of position versus time squared, my contention is that that graph will be linear. And the slope of that graph should be one half the acceleration of the object. I should also point out that in my kinematic equation, plus zero is really hiding there. We don't write it, but the y-intercept of this graph would be zero because I said that the object started with an initial position of zero. So this is the process of taking a graph that is not linear and trying to make it linear by matching it up to the equation of a line. And the reason why we might do this is just because it's easier to analyze a graph that has a constant slope. And in this particular case, if you were curious about finding the acceleration of this object, it's a lot easier to do it if you create a graph of x versus t squared as, a, as opposed to x versus t. So that way you can find more easily the slope of a straight line. So now what I want to do is I want to switch over and show you uh, sort of a little bit more of a realistic example of this. What I have here is a data table that shows the position, velocity, acceleration, and time for some object that is being dropped. So here is our object and it's being dropped. And this object happens to be experiencing an acceleration that you are probably very familiar with, a downward acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared. And I am saying that downward is the positive direction. And you know that because when you look at the data table, the acceleration is positive. And although the object starts off with an initial position of zero and an initial velocity of zero, those numbers, those values, uh, become more and more positive as time goes on. And so the first thing that I want to do is I want to show you a graph. And this first graph that I'm showing you looks like it has a constant slope. 
and the slope of that graph is 9.8 that is given by the uh, equation of the trend line that I have there it says y equals 9.8 times x this is a highly idealized data set you can see r squared equals 1 and if your data gives you an r squared value of 1 that means that the data set is a straight line for sure normally when you do a real experiment there's going to be some spread to your data and that r squared value might be close to 1 but not quite 1 so this is telling you that the data represents an exactly straight line. And the slope of that line, uh, given by the equation of that trend line, is apparently 9.8. So without even looking at the data table, you should be able to recognize that what I'm plotting in this particular graph is the object's velocity as a function of time. Connecting this back to the example that we talked about at the beginning, the slope of that graph is the acceleration of the object. That's how I'm able to identify that it happens to be a velocity versus time graph. Let's keep going. Here now is a curved graph. And so based on what we just discussed, you should probably immediately suspect that what we are staring at here is the object's position as a function of time. And that would be correct. If you compare the numbers on those axes roughly, you can see that it matches up with the, the, the data in the table. And so it's not quite linear, is it? It has a, a parabolic shape. And if I tried to analyze that, I could do so using a graphing program. Programs like Excel or uh, maybe even a more powerful graphing program would allow you to uh, fit this parabolic shape with the equation of a parabola, some sort of a y equals x squared equation. And you could learn information about the object and you could learn information about the graph from that equation. But assuming you uh, had to do this using pencil and paper, that would be a difficult graph to analyze. So instead of making that graph, the graph that you would want to make is a little bit different. And if you remember from the example that we were talking about, the graph that we want to make instead involves plotting the time squared. And so I've added a column in our data table, which is the time squared. And so all I've done is I've taken the time and I've squared it and then plotted it in a new column. And if I instead plot the position as a function of that new column, time squared, what I end up with is this last graph here. And you can see that we have a much straighter line here now because the data that we're plotting are actually proportional to one another. X is proportional to time squared. And so when I plot those two quantities together, I get a straight line. And if you remember from the, the first few minutes of the video, what we determined is that the slope of this graph should be equal to one half the object's acceleration. So let's say you very diligently plotted the position as a function of time squared. You put a best fit line on your data set and then determined that the slope of your graph was 4.9. You could then set the slope of 4.9 equal to what you know to be true about your uh, equation that you're plotting and that is the slope is 1 half a and by multiplying the equation on both sides by 2 you will find that the slope is telling you that the acceleration of this object is in fact 9.8 meters per second squared. So hopefully despite the fact uh, that we're using a highly idealized data set here, you can see the power of linearization. We only happen to look at one particular example in this video, but all sorts of relationships exist in the natural world. Sometimes, when you're measuring two things in an experiment, you get a graph kind of like the one that we got here. That is a graph that's telling you that the quantity you're plotting on the x-axis and the quantity you're plotting on the y-axis have this kind of a relationship. x, maybe, is proportional to t squared. But we know that in some cases, we get something else entirely. Like maybe we get a graph from plotting two quantities that looks like this. Or maybe 
when we collect data in an experiment it looks like this. In our math classes we've learned about equations that describe these kinds of graphs. The one in the middle is showing you that as one of the variables decreases the other one increases. So maybe x you know I'll keep using the same letters even though it might be meaningless maybe here x is proportional to 1 over t. And in the third graph maybe x is proportional to the square root of t. And so there are different relationships that you'll get depending on the experiment that you're doing. And so in each case you collect uh, data of two variables in your experiment. You plot those quantities. You look at the relationship that you see in the graph and you try to adjust what you're plotting on the axes in order to create a straight line in the graph. And by doing this, it does two things for you. One, it allows you to calculate the slope of that graph, which in most physics experiments is going to tell you some sort of meaningful physical thing about what you're studying. But it also just confirms that you know the relationship between two variables. If you were studying two things that you didn't know the meaning of or you didn't know the relationship between them, if you are able to adjust what you're plotting in order to make the graph linear, then that means you better understand the relationship between those two variables.